Today we're going to be wrapping up uh, Mark chapter 7. We're going to end this chapter. And if you were with us last week, uh, you will remember, if you weren't, let me just kind of catch you up. Jesus had left uh, the Sea of Galilee where they were based and primarily the city of Capernaum, which is Apostle Peter's hometown. And they had gone about 40 miles away to a place called Tyre uh, to get away, to rest. They'd been trying to do this for a while. And when they get there, a ton of people find them. And and that's where the the lady came that we talked about last week. And today we're going to pick up where he's going to leave. They're going to leave Tyre and they're going to go up to Sidon, which is about another 20 miles. So by the time they get to where they're going uh, for what we're going to read today, they're They're about 60 miles from what they would call home. And in this, we're going to read the healing of a a deaf man. So I'm going to read Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37, and then we'll see what this passage of Scripture might have to do or say to us today. Starting in verse 31, Jesus left Tyre and went on to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. And the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so that they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears. Then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Whatever that is, is what he said. Which means, be opened. Actually, it means to be completely opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone. But the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, Everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Now here we have Jesus healing a man in a little bit of an unusual way. When we first read it, we read it and go, okay, he's putting his fingers in his ears and he's spitting on his hands and touching his tongue. And, and it's, it's a bit strange It's pretty common for us to, uh, now we know that, we know if someone's deaf, especially if they've been deaf from birth, that they don't have the ability to what? Speak. They're not able to do that. Uh, And so this is what this man's situation is. He's deaf and he can't speak. And so as we've just read, the people bring him to Jesus and Jesus heals him and then they're amazed. Now, we're seeing this happen over and over and over as we go through the book of Mark of Jesus doing these kinds of things. Now, for the most part, from what I can tell uh, in the room, uh, none of us are deaf and none of us have a problem speaking. Uh, In fact, some of us have the opposite problem when it comes to speaking. We speak too much. Uh, It's not that we don't speak enough. So what would this have to do with us? What can we learn from this particular story? Well, the first thing that jumps out to me when I, when I read this passage of Scripture is this. It's in verse 32. We have people bringing people to Jesus. We have people bringing people to Jesus. And we see this throughout the life of Jesus. People are bringing people to Jesus. Most American Christians will go their entire life without ever initiating a Jesus conversation with someone. Most American Christians will go their entire life without initiating a Jesus conversation with someone. Most won't even do it in church. We can talk about so many other things. We can bring so many things to people. Our ideas, our wants, our desires, our views, our opinions. We've got no problems taking those things to other people. But what is it about 
initiating a real Jesus conversation with someone. Why is that so hard? I would like for you to spend some time with that. I'd like for you to ask yourself, why is this so hard? I'm not going to give you the answers this morning. I'm going to ask the question, and I'm not going to give you the answer. Why is it that you don't talk to people about Jesus? Why is it that you won't initiate a conversation with someone about Jesus, but you'll, you'll initiate all kinds of other conversations? Why? When was the last time you brought someone the good news of Jesus? Why? Why is that missing? Here we see that people brought this man to Jesus. Now, why do you think they brought this man to Jesus? I think there's two reasons. One, they believed that Jesus could help him. And two, they loved the man. They did not want him to be deaf. They did not want him to be able to not speak. They wanted him to have life. They wanted him to be able to enjoy all of the things that they were enjoying. They loved this man. Because they loved this man, they were willing to bring him to Jesus. Because they believed Jesus could heal him. They got people bringing people to Jesus. The second thing that jumps out at me is also in verse 32. It says a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him and the people begged Jesus. Now, if you were with us last week, the woman who came to Jesus, nobody brought her to Jesus. She went to Jesus on her own, right? We see how these stories are, are right next to each other. We have a lady who's going to Jesus on her own. And now we've got somebody who is being brought to Jesus. So sometimes people go to Jesus on their own, and then sometimes people have to be led, brought to Jesus, right? Uh, that's, that's the way it has to, that's, that's just the way, it, and that's what we see here. But in both places, the word begging is used. She begged Jesus to heal her daughter. And here the people are begging Jesus to heal this man. So why the begging is a question that I have. What's going on with the begging? Well, I think there's a couple of things that, that could possibly be here. And this is just us just kind of talking and thinking uh, because the scripture doesn't tell us why. Uh, begging had to be there. But one possibility could be this. Jesus is trying to see, do they really want this? Do they really want this? I know as a parent, there have been times when my daughter Madison or my daughter Amelia will come to me and they will ask for something. And I will just kind of shrug it off. Dads, y'all know how we shrug it off, right? We just kind of, we'll see. You ever said, we'll see. And then they come back and they ask again. This time they ask with a little bit more passion. Yeah, we'll see. And then they come back with again come back again. And this time they're coming with some some begging, some please, some I'll do this if you'll do that. I mean, we're going to you know going to make a bargain or whatever, but there's this it's there's more to it. And and when they start to do that, the dad heart starts to soften. I said, well, well, let's talk about this. So I think that could be in play here. Somebody just coming up and said, hey, Jesus, would you, would you heal this guy? Or, hey, Jesus, my daughter's sick, would you? You know, it would be kind of nice if you did. If you didn't, that'd be okay. No, that's not what you do when you beg. And you're pleading. So maybe it's, it's Jesus trying to see, do they really want this? They really want it. But I think even more so than that, why the begging? Is because Jesus knew that this man's real problem was not that he could not hear or speak. 
Jesus knew that this man's real problem was not that he could not hear or speak. This man's real problem was he needed a savior. He needed the Messiah. And if he got that and never could hear or speak in this earthly life, he would be okay. But because Jesus is warning them to see more than just his ability to unplug someone's ears or to allow their tongue to speak. The begging was there. I don't know why there was begging. I just know that there was begging. Here's a question that I'm asking myself this week as we look at this passage of scripture. Where do I need to beg Jesus? Where, where do I need to beg Jesus? Where do, I, where do I need to plead with him? Where am I taking things too easily? Is there some places that I'm taking no too easily? Is there some places that I'm just kind of shrugging off when I really should be stepping in and I should ask again and again? We see this multiple times in the life of Jesus. When someone begs, when someone pleads, when someone asks, he even tells a parable about it. He seems to what? He seems to like that. He seems to want that. He seems to want to know if you really want it. I remember when Madison said she wanted to go to Mississippi State. I was okay with that. It's where I went to school. It's where Lisa went to school. But this is what I told her. Because we were already set for her to go to school in Arizona. Class is set, everything. And I said, if you really want to go, you've got to figure it all out. Because we cannot afford out-of-state tuition. So you have to figure it out. Now, did I do that to be mean? No. I did that to see, do you really want this? And as she proved she really wanted it, and we had to pay out-of-state tuition, guess what dad would have figured out? How to pay out-of-state tuition. But when she went all the way in, I knew. And I think that's why God wants us to beg. They begged. Where do I need to beg Jesus? Where do I need to plead with, plead with him? And I think another question we have to ask in this is, are we asking the right questions? It's important to pray. But we really got to make sure we're praying for the right things. Am I asking the right questions? I think a really good prayer to pray would be, Jesus, what should I be asking you? I do that sometimes when I talk to people that are way smarter than me, which is often. And I'll say, well, what, what questions should I be asking you? I say, I don't even know enough to ask the right question. So what questions should I ask you? It's a great prayer. People bringing people to Jesus, we see that, we see, we've, we've, we see the why, the begging. And then, and then verse 33, when I read this account, verse 33 just leaps off the page. And this is what verse 33 says, it says, Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. What, what a great moment. Jesus is saying, they've brought this man to him. They're begging him. He takes him. He leads him away from the crowd. He takes him away to be with him. And in this, we see that Jesus puts his fingers in his ears and he spits on his own fingers and touches his tongue. And it's like, okay, well, this is strange. This is weird. This is kind of different. Because all he could have said was just say, be open. He didn't have to do the finger in the ears and the spitting on the tongue and all of that. He didn't have to do any of that. He could just have said, be open. And it would have been fine, but he didn't do that. 
Jesus took him away so that they could be alone. And what we're seeing here is this is Jesus being compassionate towards this man. His fingers in his ears and him spitting on his, fing- his own, own fingers and touching his tongue is a form of sign language. He's communicating to this man what he's about to do. He's letting him know your ears, your tongue. He's showing compassion to him. He's communicating to him. And he pulled him away from the crowd to do it. How often do you spend time alone with Jesus? Do you let him pull you away from the crowd? Because that is where he's going to speak to you the loudest and the clearest. Time alone with Jesus. It's impossible. This is profound. Are y'all ready for some profoundness? It's impossible to walk with God without walking with God. It's impossible to walk with God without walking with God. It's impossible to sit with God without sitting with God. And he pulled him away to show compassion He pulled him away to get rid of the distractions. He pulled him away so it's just the two of them. Now there's another thing here in verse 34. It says, he says, looking up to heaven, he sighed. (sighs) When you hear somebody sigh, that communicate yeah something's weary something's deep something's (sighs) defeated I gotta do this again now the scripture doesn't tell us why he sighed it does tell us that he looked to heaven and he sighed What most biblical scholars believe, the reason he was sighing here was because of the intense spiritual warfare going on. That the the warfare, the battle was so intense that as he, as just healing this man of his deafness and his inability to speak is a fight. Everything is a fight. Why? Because we have an enemy. That's why author after author in the New Testament Testament tells us to stay alert. Watch out. Put on the full armor of God. You need it because... It's a fight. People bringing people to Jesus, they were begging. Jesus takes him away to be with them. This fourth thing, I think this is really, really important to understand. Jesus will not fit a formula. Jesus will not fit a formula. You and I like formulas. The more of an engineer you are, or the more of an accountant brain that you have, the more of everything lines up, and A is B is C, and this equals this, you you, you really struggle with this one. The artist in the room, the artist listening at home, not so much. Not so much. There is no formula. And Jesus will not fit a formula. We often want clean, safe, precise, pleasing answers. Don't we? 
That's the kind of answers we want. I want it clean. I want it, I want it clear. I want it exact. I want it to be exactly what I want you to say. <laughs> I want it to be exactly what I want to hear. But this is what I want. And there's so many times this is what we want. We just want COVID to be over. Right? We just want it to be over. Jesus will not fit a formula. And here, he's healing this man. This is the first time we see. He takes the person that he's going to heal. He takes them away from the crowd. He hasn't done this before. If there were any Baptists in the room, they're having a fit. This is not the way we do it. We haven't done it this way in 150 years. Jesus, taking, he's taking away. Then he's sticking his fingers in his ears. Then he's spitting on his hands and touching his tongue. Who does that? What's up with that? You know, this is what Jesus doesn't fit a formula. And when it comes to our faith, when it comes to the Christianity and our walk with God, man, we can be so guilty of this. We want our experience to match everybody else's experience. And that's not the way that it is. We want, we want everybody to experience the same thing. No. We've got to kill this expectation that God's going to always work at the same. And just because he does something for this person, then that's what he's going to do for you. And just because he did it that way, that's what he's going to do for you. No. It doesn't work that way. Scripture tells us this over and over and over. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. And I am beautifully and wonderfully made. And God wants to do things with you that he doesn't necessarily want to do with me. And he's got plans for you that he doesn't have plans for me. He's got plans for me. He doesn't have plans for you. We are beautifully and wonderfully made. And when we try to put God in a box, listen, listen, God hasn't put us in a box. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that God has not put us in a box? When Jesus, by the time Jesus gets through and he's ready to go to the cross, do you know, do you know that he has summed up everything into one little phrase? Love one another. Three words. And when he created the garden and he put Adam in the garden, how many trees were there? Two? No, thousands. God doesn't put you in a box. Why are you trying to put him in a box? God doesn't put us in a box. Why are we trying to put him in a box? He's going to do it his way. That's why you got to go get alone with him. Because he knows when you need his fingers in your ears. He knows when he needs to put his spit on your tongue. Right? Do you believe that or you not believe that? Do you believe that Jesus knows exactly what you need? And exactly how you need it? And exactly when you need it? We don't need to mourn that. We need to be joyful in that. Not mourn it, but be joyful. Jesus will not fit a formula. So let's stop doing it. Let's stop trying to put him in a box. Fifth thing. Every time I read a passage of scripture like this or teach on a passage of scripture like this, I'll get multiple emails with this question. Why did Jesus tell them not to tell anyone? Why did Jesus tell the people not to tell anyone? In verse 36, he says, Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone. But the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. And now we have a, a clear lesson in human nature, right? You want to spread something? Tell people it's a secret. Tell them it's a secret and you don't need to tell anybody. But you really want everybody to know. Everybody will know by lunch. Okay? This is just human nature. The more he told them not to, the more they did. Okay, so why is he telling them not to? This is pretty basic. Uh, it's pretty much the same every time. What Jesus does not want the people to see, they do not want to see him as a miracle worker. 
they do not want him, they, he does not want them to, to, for them to see him as a witch doctor. That's, that's not what he's doing. Oh, this is a guy that can, can heal your physical ailments. And I say this all the time, and I, I hope it's shocking to some of you for the first time if you've never heard it, but if you have heard it, be a reminder. You do realize every single person Jesus healed died. Right? Okay. This man's problem wasn't that he was deaf. There's a handicap. Disability, she would be nice to hear. But that's not his problem. His problem is he needs a Messiah. The problem is he needs a Savior. His problem is he needs a Lord. And Jesus is saying, listen, y'all have known this guy his whole life. He's been deaf his whole life. You've never heard him say anything. Now he's running around yelling and screaming in clear words. And he's hearing the birds and the creek and the noise and the wind and the trees for the first time and he's dancing because for the first time in his life he can hear the wedding song but that's not his problem and Jesus knows that so every time when Jesus would say don't tell anybody that's why he's telling them I'm here to be the Savior. I'm here to take away the sins of the world. I'm not here to heal your withered hand. I will do it. You've asked me. You've begged me. Yes, my compassion is moved. I'm going to fix your hand. I'm going to fix your ears. I'm going to heal your daughter. Everybody's hungry and it's late in the day, so I'm going to make food for everyone. Yes, it's scary. This is a stormy night. I'm going to make this wind stop. He did those things. That's not the point. It's not the point. I'll close with, with this, verse 37. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he, everything he does is wonderful. I want you to, for those, if you're at home, you can do it out loud. You can scream it at home uh, and here. Uh, just repeat after me. Everything he does is wonderful. Everything he does is wonderful. Everything he does is wonderful. That's where I want to get. That's where I want to get. I want to get to the place where I can say, everything he does is wonderful. When it's a pandemic, everything he does is wonderful. Whatever it is that you're mourning, everything he does is wonderful. He is God and I am not. He knows way more than I do. I want to get to the place where I can say everything he does is wonderful. Because here is what a shallow faith is. A shallow faith says, God is wonderful and only the miracles. God is wonderful only when the situation is good. That's a shallow faith. A deep faith. A deep faith. After the beating and after the no trial and after being taken to the dungeon and after being chained to the floor in a disgusting place with no fresh air with open wounds that are bound to get infected and having mourned and having cried and having doubted 
a deep faith at midnight and begins to sing. Oh, how wonderful you are. That's where we're going. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for I thank you for the ability to hear. To hear the smoothness of a piano. The beat of a drum. The strings of a guitar. The sounds of a horn. the smoothness of a well-played saxophone. The crash of an ocean wave. Birds singing in the trees. The rush of a mountain river. our name being called. So many things to be thankful for and what we hear. My Father, there is nothing sweeter to hear than you love us. And you desperately want to take us alone and speak to us. because of your compassion for us and how desperately you want us to hear you when you say, I've got you. Don't worry. I got you. Father, may you give us the ability to bring people to you because we love them and because we know you are the answer. And along the way, when we have to beg, help us to beg. And along the way, help us not to put you in a box because you don't follow a formula. And Father, may we all get to the place where we're deep in our faith so that we can say, that everything that you do is wonderful. In your name we pray, amen.